welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. How many of you need the favor of God in your life? That is everyone in here. If you didn't raise your hand, I'm going to quickly review, then we're going to go into part two tonight of the favor of God. Favor. The word favor is a a word that we often use as a word grace. Unmerited favor is the standard definition in the evangelical community of Christendom. We don't use words like unmerited favor. Unmerited means undeserved But favor means, in the Webster's Dictionary, approval, support, preference, kindness, a kind act, an approving attitude, preference, loyalty, to distinguish somebody by giving them something valuable. Favor. The word charis means to benefit, to bring forth. And our definition of favor, or actually grace, here at The Rock is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Pastor Jim Cobray, a beautiful definition of grace. I added to that definition several years ago, and my definition was God's grace is God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. He empowers me to live according to his purposes and his ways. And he gives me his divine grace and power and ability to do what I could never do. But let me give you just another definition because this massive topic has many facets like a diamond that has many cuts. And as the light shines on it, you see it in different aspects of its beauty and its glory. Let me give you yet another definition. And this is the definition that I gave you last week on the favor of God. It is God's supernatural influence on us and through us. To bring his benefit and blessing. It is God's supernatural influence on us and through us to bring his benefit and his blessing. Favor will take you further faster. It will take you where you could never go on your own. It will open doors that no man can open for you, that God opens doors of favor for you, and it will close doors that need to be closed in your life so God can route you and take you in the direction that he needs you to go. Let me just do a little bit of, re- of, just a, of review from last week. What does favor do? Favor is necessary for uncommon success. If you want to have an uncommon success in your life, and the word blessing in the Bible means the power to succeed. So if you want to be blessed by God, if you need the favor of God, the power to succeed, an uncommon power to succeed in your own life, then you and I are going to need the favor of God. We cannot work hard enough. We cannot work long enough. And we cannot work smart enough to fulfill our God-given destiny. It's going to take the favor of God. It's going to take the purposes of God, the plans of God, the direction of God. It's going to take the ability of God on us and through us, his influence, to get this job done on each one of our lives. And God has ordained every one of us to walk in the good works that he has already chosen for our lives. I have a path that God has already laid the way for me to walk in. Jim's got a path. You have a path. Our paths may be different, but they are all ordained of God with God's plans and God's purposes, and we will not accomplish them without his divine favor. Favor will cause us to do what we could never do. Favor will give our prayers answers. Favor will surround us with his protection And favor will give us his blessing, his life, and his joy. Now, the definition of happiness is a delight over outward circumstances. The definition of joy is an inward delight regardless of outward circumstances. Happiness, an outward delight because of circumstances. Joy, an inward delight, a heart delight regardless of what is happening in your outward condition. There is joy, there is life, there is hope, there is faith working on the inside of you, keeping you going in those difficult times. Who has God's favor? We do, the children of God. We looked at Colossians chapter 121. 
And it says that we who were dead in our trespasses and our sins, he has cleansed us, he has made us alive. I'm just going to read it to you. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you, he's taken you to the Father, holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. If you don't know you're favored, if you don't know you're special, if you don't know you're privileged, then there is something wrong with you. Because the devil is lying and you're believing the lies of the enemy. You used to be an enemy of God. You used to mess up in your mind. You used to want to do those things that were opposed to the ways of God. But you were born of the Spirit of God. You got a brand new spirit. You got reconnected to the Father by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the living God indwells us now. And He is changing us from the inside out. Taking us from glory to glory. He didn't say we were going to be perfect. But He was saying we are being changed from glory to glory glory and what I was last year is not what I am today and what I am today is not going to be what I'm supposed to be next year if I am following in the footsteps of the favor of God because before the Lord I am holy I am blameless I'm above reproach no one can bring a charge according to this to the throne of God against me and it'll stand no one can because why I'm washed in the blood I'm a citizen of heaven, and I'm a daughter, a privileged daughter of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if you are a woman, you are a daughter. If you're a son, you're a son. Women, we have the same privileges as the sons and in our inheritance, but we are citizens of heaven. And I really don't believe the body of Christ really gets the kingdom of God. I think we live in the old world nature. We live in a world that is filled with stress, with unbelief, with fear, with trouble, and we look at those things and we look at those and we order our lives and our emotions by what we are seeing and hearing and feeling and tasting and touching instead of living by faith in what God has spoken over us and what we can and should have as his children. And in this generation, there's going to be a great need for us to quickly grow up. There is going to be a need for Christians to no longer be ashamed or to be embarrassed for us to be politically correct because we will never be politically correct in this nation as believers because our citizenship is of heaven. When they are redefining marriage, when they are redefining the social structure, when they are redefining finances and redefining what is right and what is wrong, you and I must be defined by one thing and one thing only. It is the living, breathing Word of God. It is what God says. There is nothing else, and I must order my life by that, and that is going to take courage, and it's going to take maturity to stand up and not be ashamed and not be afraid and not be intimidated by the forces of intellect in this nation and intimidation in this nation to shut you up. We need the favor of God as his people. Favor comes from God, but it flows through man. God uses man to bring us what we need. And I'll show you that in a minute. Favor is not an accident. God bestows his favor on his obedient children. Favor is not a gift that I can earn, a wage to be earned. It is a gift that I receive, and I can position myself for favor, and we're going to look at that tonight. Now, the two things tonight I want to discuss with you about the favor of God according to the Word of God are, number one, I can grow in God's favor. I can grow up in it. I can mature in it. I can begin to position myself and access myself to have the favor of God working in my life. Now, the scripture for that would be 1 Samuel in the Old Testament and Luke 2 in the New Testament. 1 Samuel 2, 26, speaking of the prophet and the last judge of Israel, Samuel, it says, And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with Lord and men. We see in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. He grew up as a child. He increased in wisdom, natural wisdom. 
He increased in spiritual wisdom. He increased in size and stature and in favor with God and men. You and I can begin to increase and grow in the favor of God, just like our bodies are programmed to increase and grow and become mature as adults. How do I grow in God's favor? I want to give you three things tonight about positioning myself and growing in the favor of God. And we're going to look at three different people in the Word of God so we can get examples on this. Samuel grew in the favor of God. Jesus grew in the favor of God and men. I need to grow. In my age, I'm a senior now, 62, going to be 63 this year. I need the favor of God to do what I'm supposed to do for the rest of my life so that I end my life in success and honor and not in defeat and despair. No matter what age you are, whether you are young or you are old, we need to understand how we can grow in this favor. Number one. If I'm going to grow in the favor of God, I'm going to have to diligently seek God's will. Proverbs 11:27 says, "He who earnestly seeks good finds favor, but trouble will come to him who seeks evil." Proverbs 14:9 says, "Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor." Now I said in this point on the how-tos, because I'm a how-to person. I hear what you're saying, but how do I put this to work in my life? If I'm going to position myself, it's not a wage to be earned. It's a gift to be received. If I'm going to position myself for the favor of God and be in the right place at the right time and have the Lord bless me, then I'm going to have to diligently seek God's will. And this proverb says, he who earnestly seeks good will find favor. Now, I wanted to say that because... Jesus defined good in Matthew chapter 18 when one of the Jewish men asked him and he said, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. Good is a God word. The goodness of God is the standard that God has set in the universe. He is a God of benefit. He is a God of blessing. He's a God of goodness. Everything he does brings benefit and blessing. Everything God does. So if he is good and he alone is good, then in my logic, I decided that if God is good and there is none good but God, then God's goodness must be God's will, God's way. If I'm going to live in the goodness of God and if I'm going to seek the goodness of God, then I'm going to have to seek God's will and do things God's way. There were people in the Bible that did God's will, but they did it in their own way, and they failed like Cain. God's will was for Cain to bring an offering. He brought the wrong offering the wrong way, and he failed. He did what God said, but not the way God said to do it. There are ways that God said to do things. There are reasons. He made us. He's the creator. He's God. There is no other God but God. When God says it, that is how it is. And how he tells us to do it is how he wants it done. And when I seek God's will, God's way, I now position myself and I begin, I begin to enter into the favor of God. Now, I want to use the, an example of this is Esther. Esther was a woman who was taken out of her home. She was taken to a, a, a foreign land. King Artaxerxes was the king. He lost his wife. He divorced his wife because she made him mad. So his elder said, let's have a beauty contest. Let's bring you a new wife. And so they took the prettiest girls in the realm that he was ruling in, and they brought them to the palace. Now, Esther was one of those girls that was taken, and she was being raised by her uncle Mordecai, her cousin Mordecai. And Esther, I'm sure, didn't want to leave her people. I'm sure Esther didn't want to go to the palace. I'm sure Esther didn't want to be cloistered for a year, having treatments of oil and myrrh and scents and perfumes so she could spend one night with a king who was crazy. One look from him and you could be dead. Now, these girls took a whole year to get ready for one night. They were virgins, and they had one night with this king. And if the king remembered them, and if he liked them, then he would call them back into his bedroom, or, or they would spend the rest of their days separated in the harem, period. And 
these girls were allowed to bring something from the palace, gold, jewelry, clothes, whatever they wanted. They were given the royal treasure and the royal realm, and they could bring it with them to spend one night with that king. And whatever they brought in, they took with them to the harem. Now, remember, they lived a life of loneliness, and they lived a life of celibacy if the king did not call their name again. Now, I probably, if I was Esther, wouldn't want to be there. That wouldn't be my divine design for my life. I wouldn't want to be married to a king that could have my life at a whim. That there was no security whether I would ever have children or not. And I was in competition with thousands of other beautiful girls who were all tens. Can somebody go there with me? This is not a good scenario. This is not what I think Esther would have wanted for her life, but she was there. And the favor of God comes in terrible times and in dark places. When you don't want to be where you are and you don't want to do what you have to do, there's a favor of God and the plan of God on your life for bigger purposes. It's his divine influence on me and through me for his benefit and his blessing and his plan. He has a bigger plan than we do. So here's Esther. And she only wanted to please the king. When it was her time to go before the king, she could have brought gold and jewels and gowns. She could have done anything she wanted to enhance her beauty. But this is what she did. Esther chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Now when that turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go to the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Verse 17, and the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head, and he made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, she could have used all the props of the human flesh. She could have done everything else those other girls did, to bring attention to herself and to give her wealth in the harem because whatever they brought in, they got to take out. Are you hearing me? That means jewels. That means gold. That means all the wealth of the palace was at their beck and call, and they, if they could wear it, they could go in with it. She chose not to do anything but what the eunuch told her to bring, and she brought in just a scarf. She brought in nothing that would enhance her own beauty. She brought in nothing that would make her wealthy. She simply followed the plan and the purpose, and she trusted God, and the favor of God came on her. So when you and I just seek the will of God, when everybody else is getting rich by cheating on their taxes, when everybody else is under the table, when everybody else is doing something off somewhere else, and God didn't say to do it that way, and we don't do it that way, and we do what God says, it doesn't enhance us. It doesn't make us look better. It doesn't make us wealthier. It doesn't give us any kind of an edge on anybody else. It actually diminishes us. But when we do it God's will, God's way, the favor of God now begins to come on our lives. We position ourselves for the favor from God. Diligently seek God's will. Goodness. Two, bind mercy and truth to my heart. If I want to position myself for the favor of God, what does that mean? Bind mercy and truth to my heart. Well, let's look at this. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. It says, let not mercy, that word is hasad in the Hebrew. It means loving kindness, mercy. It's not the mercy that we think of in the New Testament. It's the loving kindness kindness of God. It's the unfailing love of God, Hassan. Bind the unfailing love of God, the mercy of God, and truth. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. And so find favor. See, favor is found. It's not earned. It's found. It's a gift to be received. We can grow in this. Bind mercy and truth around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Now, I've got a necklace on. This is bound around my neck. Wherever I go, this necklace goes. 
It travels with me. It's been on me all day long, and it, it has been on my body, and I have seen it and touched it all day long. It's around my neck. I have bound it. It's become one with me. It's, I'm wearing mercy. I'm wearing loving kindness. I'm wearing truth. I'm wearing it like a garment. I'm wearing it like something that goes with me wherever I go. I don't forget it. I don't leave it at home. I don't leave it in the car. I don't leave it at church. I put it on and I wear it all day long. I wear the mercy of God, the loving kindness of God. When God brings somebody into my path that I need to forgive. The loving kindness of God begins to work in me and I begin to do what he asked me to do. And I find the favor of God as I begin to do the will of God. Binding the truth around my heart. What does that mean? It means God's word is my dictionary. It is my encyclopedia. It is my textbook. It is my standby, my maker. It is my, it does everything I need it to do. It is my teacher. It is my schoolmaster. It is my, it, it, it actually just completely surrounds me as I write it on my heart. And when I want to forget what it says because it's engraved on the stones of my heart, I can't. And I will be convicted if I do something different. The word is important to me. It rules me. I am a word-ruled woman. I am not a Society ruled woman. I am not an education, educatedly ruled woman. Just the way I'm talking, you can tell that. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer according to human standards. But I don't give a flip about human standards. I care what God says. There is fact and there is truth. The fact is this natural world. But the truth is what God says about the facts of the natural world. There was a woman, her name was Ruth. She was a Moabitess. She lived in a world that was cursed to the 10th generation, according to Israel. She was not even allowed to go into any kind of tabernacle or sanctuary if she was ever to go to Israel. She lived in a cursed, a cursed generation and a cursed people. Wrong tribe, wrong time. God cursed her, her people. She was married to a man who died and this man's mother was Naomi. Naomi, and the book of Ruth is about this, she lost her husband. She lost both her sons. She had two daughter-in-laws. She said, go back to your parents. There's nothing here I can help you with. Just go home. And Ophrah went home, but Ruth said, no, I'm not leaving you. I am not going to leave your side. I'm going to stay with you. Now, I'm talking about binding mercy and truth. I'm talking about favor. Oprah, you don't ever hear about again. She went into the annals of history, and you do not hear about her in the word of God. Ruth is in the genealogies of Jesus. So something happened, and the favor of God came on her life because she bound mercy and truth in her life and on her heart, and she bound it around her neck. Now, Ruth says in Ruth chapter 2, verse 11, it says, and Bo, it says in Ruth chapter 2, let me find it for you. And treat me not to leave you. Ruth 1, verse 16. Ruth said to Naomi when she's begging her to leave, she says, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God, the Lord do so unto me if this is not true. And she already believed in the, in the God of Jehovah. She already believed in Israel's God. She had already left her foreign gods. And she left Everything to follow a broken woman back to Bethlehem where she was going to be cursed. But she would not let Naomi go alone. You see, she had bound mercy on her heart. Loving, loyal kindness. She went with Naomi regardless of what it was going to cost her. No future, no husband, no nothing. She said, I don't care. I'm going with you. I'm serving you, and I'm serving your God. I'm talking about positioning yourself for favor. The story goes on in the book of Ruth, and Naomi and her are starving, so there's a, a welfare system called gleaning. It's where you go into the fields after they have, after they have um, harvested the fields, and whatever has been dropped, they were not allowed to pick up, and you were allowed to pick them up as poor people. It was, it was, a, it was a welfare system. So Ruth says, at least I'm going to glean. We're starving. I can go to the field, and I can glean. 
And it says that she happened in the field of Boaz. And there she began to just, just take up the gleaning and just take up the little pieces, you know. I can, here's a little bit of here. Here's a little bit of barley here. Here's a little bit of barley here. And she worked all day. You see, you see she was working on the leftovers. But God did not call us to live on leftovers. God has not called you to live poor. He has not called you to live on leftovers. He has not called you to live like you are a second-class citizen. But he is testing us. And he's seeing where the word of God is on our hearts, whether there's mercy and loyal, loving kindness in us. You see, it's a test of character. And whether or not the word is going to be etched on our hearts, whether we're going to choose the gods of this world or the God of Israel. You see, it's all going to happen. And there she was, gleaning in that field. And lo and behold, here comes Boaz. He owned the field. And let me read what it says. Ruth chapter 2. I love this story. It's one of my favorite. And Boaz answered, Ruth 2.11. He sees her. He owns these fields. He's a rich man. And Boaz answers and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. And the very field that she gleaned became the field that she owned because the story goes on. She married that man. She married him. They had a baby. His name was Obed, which means servant. Obed had a baby. His name was Jesse. Jesse had a baby. His name was David. David had a baby centuries later. His name was Jesus, and she is in the genealogies of, De of Jesus because of the favor of God, because mercy was on her. She went to the fields for somebody else. She, she died to her own abilities and her own future on the behalf of Naomi. She laid down her life, and she was willing to live with nothing and not complain. She didn't know she was going into Boaz's field. She didn't know she was going to be the ancestress of Jesus. She didn't know she was going to be the great-grandmother of King David himself, but because she bound mercy and truth to her heart, and she wouldn't let go of them. The loving kindness of God and the word of the Lord. She owned the fields that she gleaned in, and the favor of God changed her life. And she went from not having enough to having more than enough. God wants us to have more than enough to bless this earth with his goodness. And we are, we are so ready to just submit to the gleanings of this world. One more. Can I give you one more? I'm going to position myself for the favor of God. I can't, I can't earn it, but I can grow and I can position myself to receive it. If you're willing and obedient, Isaiah 119, God said through the prophet, if you're willing, attitude, obedient action, you will eat the good of the land and be blessed. God says, number three, if you're going to position yourself, you're going to have to walk in faith. You're going to have to walk in faith, child. First, you're going to have to diligently seek my will, my good will, my will and my way. Two, I'm going to have to buy mercy, loving kindness, unconquerable love, loyalty, integrity, mercy on my heart and write his words on my heart. And now three, walk in faith. And the one I want to use tonight is the last one, the last example of favor, and his name is Noah. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. What do you think that reward is? Favor. A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I have a beautiful family in the Lord, but, but I, I came up from a very, very, very restricted evangelical community I was born into. And it was a sin to expect anything good from God. It was wrong to believe for things that were just selfish. And yet God, throughout the word, is a God of blessing and a God of goodness. 
He's given us all things to richly enjoy. He says, don't let money have a hold of you. It can be a God. You are not to let money be your God. You are to be the God over money. You are to let me rule the money. It's a resource. That's all it is. It's not our God. But it's not wrong to be blessed. It's not wrong to expect. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And Noah found favor in the eyes of God when the entire world was corrupted. When it was going to be destroyed by a flood, there was one man that was righteous that God said, Noah found grace. He found favor in my eyes. And it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the, of his, for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Listen, Noah had never seen rain he lived in a world that was so dark it was about to be destroyed. Sometimes I sigh in my spirit and I tell Jim, I don't like this world anymore. I'm weary of the constant bickering and foolishness and selfishness of our nation and our leaders. I am weary that there is no one in this nation to stand up and to be righteous and stand for righteousness. I'm weary of a press that seems to put down that which is good and call it evil and bring and raise up evil and call it good to a nation that is absolutely on its way and hurling into darkness and destruction. Don't think God can't remove the hedge from America of protection. I'm weary. And yet I look at Noah and he took him 120 years to build that ark. He preached righteousness for 120 years to a people that would not listen because he was the only one with his family that got on that boat. Let's just look at a couple things about Noah. I'm talking about walking by faith. The people had 120 years to turn around and they didn't. Noah and the family and the animals sat in the ark seven days before the first drop of rain. Even more time for people to rethink their lifestyles. Nobody did. God gave him directions for a floating ship, not a sailing ship. Noah received no instructions for a rudder. If you know anything about boating, the rudder is that which moves the boat either to port or it moves it to starboard. It is the steering mechanism on a boat. It's how you get to where you're supposed to go. You set a course, you, you take your sails or your powerboat, whatever it is, and you use that rudder, that steering mechanism, and it turns the boat. There was no rudder on that ark. It was a floating vessel. It was not a sailing vessel. He could not plot a course. He could only stay alive. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. They were on that ark one year, one month, and 27 days. They had a lot of animals on that ark. That was a lot of you-know-what to clean up. What did you do for one year, one month, and 27 days? Well, I stayed alive on a floating vessel, a floating zoo, and I fed animals that should be eating me and I cleaned up their stalls because in one year, if I didn't, they'd be drowning in their own animal poop. And there you have the Cobra checkoff. I have to tell you this. I don't know what it is about our family, but we, either, we always get into a conversation about poop somehow. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It'll be in the pulpit. Jim will always make some mention of it. Here I am talking to you about it. I don't know what it is. Don't psychoanalyze us, but, you know, maybe we got some issues God needs to deal with. I don't know what it is. But <laughs> Noah was shoveling a whole lot of you-know-what. The ark was one and a half football fields long. It was 450 feet long. The Mayflower was 90 feet long. The Cuddy's Ark was 212 feet long. An aircraft carrier that can carry 5,000 people and hold 90 planes is 1,000 feet long. Half, over half the size of that ark. That was one big floating boat with no rudder. It was quite a feat 
to build an ark and to preach righteousness and look like a complete fool for 120 years. But Noah had a word from God. God had found favor. Noah had found favor in God's eyes, and he was used by God to save the creation. And isn't it interesting that God used a man who had dominion to save this planet, to save the creation of this planet? Don't tell me we're not stewards of this earth. We are. We are. God has given us dominion on this planet, and we are to oversee his creation and take care of it. Doesn't say go crazy over it. Doesn't say be afraid of it. Says steward it with the wisdom of God. And Noah was on that boat one year, one month, and 27 days, and God used him to save everything that we see today that's alive. That's quite a feat. He had favor with God. Why? Because Noah walked in faith. When things got tough, he walked in faith. When he didn't understand, he walked in faith. When it was hard, he walked in faith. When it didn't make sense, he walked in faith. When everybody rejected him, he walked in faith. When he looked like a fool, he walked in faith. When there was the foolishness of preaching on his life, preaching righteousness and rain that is coming and judgment that is coming, and they laughed him to scorn, he walked in faith. He didn't stop. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. He continued doing what God said to do. He diligently sought the will of God. He bowed mercy and truth around his heart like Ruth and Esther. And he walked by faith and not by sight. So if you and I want to position ourselves for the favor of God that will take us further faster, that will give us uncommon success when we need it, that far surpasses our ability and makes us able to do what is impossible in the natural to do, then, beloved, remember three things tonight diligently seek God's goodness in your life. Bind mercy and truth around the tablets of your heart and your neck and walk by faith and not by sight. And you will see the favor of God. It may take some time, but you're going to see the favor of God springing up in your life and bringing you into his destiny and his plan and his purpose for you. I'm done. I've got a few moments left in this service, and I need to talk to you about something that's very, very up close and personal. And I need to ask you a question, and it's a personal question. You don't have to answer it. Just answer it in your mind. Answer it in your heart. And you might think this is offensive for me to even ask this, but I honestly don't care. I'm not trying to be offensive, but there's too much at stake in your life for me not to ask this question. And here it is. My question is, if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? Where would you live forever? Where would it be? Where are you going? And if you said, well, I don't believe I'm going anywhere. I believe I just stay in the grave. That's a very depressing thought, and that's not what God says, and you don't. God says eternity is in our hearts and that we were made to live forever. Not these bodies are going back to dust, but your soul, your spirit, is going to live forever. God says there's two places that you can go. You can go to my heaven, or you can go to the hell that I've created for Satan and his rebellious angels. God never created you to go to hell. It will severely and only be your choice that sends you there, not a loving God. But my job and my responsibility is to bring you to a thought and to a confrontation tonight, heaven or hell. If you're saying, well, I think I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person, that's a great thought. But what makes you think that you're good enough for heaven? Because God says that good people don't actually go to heaven. He said that our goodness, our human goodness, is like a filthy rag in comparison to his standard of goodness. And that that standard is what measures goodness, and we fall short. All, he said, have messed up and fallen short of my goodness. No human is good enough on their own ability to get to my heaven. So that's out. No matter how much you go to church, no matter how much you carry your Bible, no matter how much you try to change your behavior, 
No matter how much you try to behave, you can't behave good enough to get to heaven. So that, that whole deal that we're sold in America, that all roads lead to heaven and all good people go to heaven, that's, that's bull. That's not happening. Not according to the, will, to the word of God. It's not going to happen. So let's keep going. If you said, well, I think I'm going to heaven. And then I have to ask, well, why do you think you're going to heaven? Because we can't think our way into heaven. And if you said, well, I know Jesus. Well, that's good because Americans know Jesus. If you're not Buddhist or Muslim or Jewish, you're probably going to think I'm probably Christian. But you see, you're not born into Christianity through a natural birth in a family. That's not how you get to heaven. You don't think your way in there. I, I can't think about Jesus enough to get to heaven. I can't even believe that he's the son of God enough to get to heaven because the devil believes he's the son of God and he's not going to heaven. So it's not what I think in my head. It's what I've done in my heart. And God says there's only one way to heaven, one way, and it's God's way, God's will, God's way. And God says you must be born again. Now that's made us crazy and confused us and all kinds of things and thoughts and ideas have come out of that. But Jesus was very, very clear about what born again meant. He was very clear about it. And he told us and he taught us that you and I were severed from God by something called death, sin, separation. That's what death is. It's separation. You can't get back to God on your goodness or on your thinking ability. You can only get to God. On one thing, and Jesus said, you must be born again. And he told Nicodemus one late Jerusalem night, Nicodemus was a celebrity rabbi. He was a teacher of the law. He knew everything about the law. He was a good man. He fed the poor. He clothed the naked. He's a good man, but his goodness wouldn't get him to heaven. And when he came to Jesus and he said, how do I get to eternity? Jesus said, Nick, you got to be born again. And he said, ah, that's crazy. I can't climb into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, you are a teacher of the law, and you don't get this. What is born of the flesh is flesh. You're in this body. You were born into this world, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. Your spirit and my spirit, that which lives forever, has to be born again because it's separated from God. Here's how Jesus said it was going to happen. One way and only one way, and it cost heaven everything, everything. Jesus said in John chapter 3, this chapter with Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, I'm going to a cross. I'm qualified. Because I'm all God and I'm all man. I fused with humanity. I am the last Adam. I'm climbing on that cross and I'm going to take the sin of the world, your sin and the sin of this planet, the sin of every human being. I'm going to take it on myself. I will be the sacrifice. I will take the penalty for you. And if you will look to that cross, Nicodemus, with faith, which means you'll, you'll look to that cross and you'll believe I am who I said I am and you'll surrender your life and your heart. You'll be born again. I'll bring you out of darkness and I'll take you to the Father. You see, you can't earn it. You can't work for it. Like favor, you can only receive it. And say, Lord, I see you on that cross. I believe you are who you said you are. I believe you did what you said you would do. I believe you died for me. I believe you're not dead, but you're raised from the dead. I believe that you took my sin on you. And I believe that you are the Savior of the world. And you surrender your life to him. And you let him, invite him in to be Savior and Lord. Lord means boss. At that moment, you're born again. And a whole new life begins for you. And you're reconciled back to the Father. And you are now a citizen of heaven. And you are heaven bound. And if you have never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, no matter how good you are, no matter how intellectual you are, no matter how much you've tried to change your behavior, how much you've tried to do things for God, if you've never surrendered and seen him as Savior and Lord, you're not born again. God sent you here tonight to change your destiny. This is where favor begins. This is where his blessing begins. It's when he takes us out of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, and he brings us to him. So all over this auditorium, I'm just going to ask, where are you going to spend eternity? If you're not sure, then tonight God wants you to be sure. He wants you to surrender and let Jesus be the Lord and Savior of your life. You do that by inviting him into your life. We're going to do that in a minute. If you've been a good person, but you've never surrendered your heart in your life, the Lord brought you here tonight to change your destiny because your goodness isn't going to get you there, but his love and his mercy and his cross will. But you've got to surrender your life to him and let him be Savior and Lord. 
If you backslid and you serve God at one time, but you're not serving him now and you're here tonight. You're here tonight by divine appointment. God brought you here tonight. No man can say Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. He led you here tonight. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to just count to three. I'm going to hit this notebook real loud. Bang, like that. Why? So that we can all do it together with heads up and eyes open. We don't bow our heads and close our eyes in this church only because we have a very strong conviction that if we can't say yes to Jesus in a safe environment, how can I walk out those doors and live for Jesus in a hostile environment? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So all over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus, I'm talking to you. You need to get right with God tonight. You know you're not sure where you're going to go, and you want to be sure tonight. All over this auditorium. Are you ready? I'm going to count to three. Just lift your hands. We'll do it all together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. I see that hand. 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 See that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see another hand. Hands are going up. Let's do this. Because of the time, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to sing this song. If you raised your hand or you didn't and you wish you would have, I just want you to grab what you brought to church with you. Slip out of the aisles. Meet me at this altars, and let's get right with God tonight. We'll do it very quickly. This won't take much time. If you raised your hand or you wish you would have and you should, just slip out of the aisles and come and join me at this altar. Let's get right with God tonight. God brought you here because he loves you. He's not mad at you, but he is the only one that can save you. You cannot save yourself. You cannot behave your way into heaven. There's only one way. It's his way. We must be born again. So quickly come down, quickly come down if you need to get right with God. I'm going to give you a moment as we sing this song. We're coming. Jesus, I believe. I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. Is there anyone else? I feel like there's still about five of you that still need to come. You know, in this church, we give an altar call. We invite you. We just invite you to come and meet the king with us every service. And this, this wonderful congregation sits through our invitations. And they pray with us and believe with us because they know that this is the beginning of life. We're going to give you one more opportunity. If you need to get right, just quickly come out of your seat. I can't make you come, but I can invite you to come. I'm not your savior. I'm just the Nana that's going to bring you and say, here, come and meet him. He loves you. He's not mad at you. He's the only one that can fix you. He's not in shock over your sin or your life or your mess. You don't trust yourself, no, but you can trust him, and he'll give you the power to live a life for him. That's you tonight. Quickly come one more time. Elijah, just sing it one more time. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that. Well, come back. If you didn't come down, it's all right. You come back. God loves you. He's not mad at you. And you need to smile because you're not going to a funeral. You're actually going to have life. And he's not mad at you. He loves you. You can't mess up too much for him. And at The Rock, we're going to take you. This is Pastor Joel. We're going to take you into our new beginners, our new believers room. Nothing weird's going to happen. I'm about as weird as it gets around here. I can't believe I talked about Noah shoveling. You know what? Can you believe that? He's a wonderful God. He's not uptight. He's not nervous. He's not mad. He's big. And he's bigger than we know. And he's very long-suffering with us. And he signed you angels, and they are all having a party right now because they've been working very hard to keep you all alive. So this is Pastor Joel. If you'll just turn left.
We're going to pray with you privately so you're not out here as a spectacle.